This is Territory Tales, the stories behind the fascinating people and places that make up Oregon's Mount Hood Territory. I am your host, Jared Lyman. Joining me is Molly Johnson, as always. Molly, how are you today? I am fantastic. Thank you all for tuning in. You know, I am over the moon excited because it is not every day that I am in the presence of a celebrity, the presence of a household name. <laughs> and and, and he, he's uh, making a face at me, but the, the fact of the matter is, that's the truth. Our guest today is somebody that if you've ever been to a grocery store, you've probably seen his face and heard his name. Molly, please do the introduction. Okay, everyone. This is Bob Moore. He is the face and name of Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, and uh, we are just so excited to have you here. Thank you, Molly. It's a <laughs> pleasure to be here. Good. <laughs> So, and Jared. <laughs> oh, thank you. She, she's much more fun to be around than me. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, it sounds like I jest, but the fact of the matter is, your company is everywhere. And I remember actually seeing your products before I ever moved to Oregon. So that's one of the really fun things is that, you know, when I came here and find out that these things that I was already familiar with are made in the area I get to represent, it was, it was exciting for me. But... It's a long process to get to that point. So why don't you start at the beginning for us and tell us how Bob's Red Mill came to be? Well, I, goodness, I almost have to speak to my whole life, but uh, <laughs> the business aspect of Bob's Red Mill always fascinated me because my father was a businessman, and we spoke many times when I was growing up. My dad was a really swell fellow, and uh, about being in business together in something. It would probably have been in addressing uh, sales and that kind of thing, advertising. And, uh, but unfortunately, my father, uh, much after much warnings, uh, smoked about three packs of cigarettes a day and at 49 years old, uh, died of a massive heart attack. Mm. And it's, uh, he was very severely missed by his family and certainly by his son. And, uh, but what stayed with me was this desire to be in business for myself. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that there was something out there that I could do. In living in Los Angeles at the time, even though I was born here in Portland, Oregon, uh, that was on a much expanded, uh, the, everything was going on down there. People were moving in. Business was great. Uh, they were building tracks and tracks of homes, lots of those for GIs, which I was. And so, as it used to be, uh, every corner, major corner, had a gas station on it. And we were living in a new area. We had just bought a nice, lovely new home. And uh, here's a sign on a corner, uh, coming soon, mobile gas station. And then under it in smaller type was, be a mobile dealer huh. and call this number. Well, there's an opportunity for business. And I did call the number. And I asked them how much money it would take to get that gas station on that corner, which was close to my home. And we made this thing happen. I'll, I'll cut cut short, but I became uh, a mobile dealer at 25 years old. Wow. And uh, I think I did pretty well. I had some ups and downs. I spent money profligately when I didn't really have it, just because you handle a lot of money. And But I began to learn, and those were probably good lessons for me. And I had lots of help uh, from wise and astute people that came into my life that helped me to do a better job. And uh, even the mobile people had little classes on how to be a better dealer and how to do your book work and do, how to make money. So that was a successful part of my life. Then came the unsuccessful part. Los Angeles in 1956, 57, 58, 59 was... Uh, very smoggy, and uh, they had a severe problem down there at that time. And I just happened to be uh, one that had a terrible time with it. My eyes would uh -huh. water, and I sneezed a lot. And, and we had three sons, and 
uh, by that time, and it was just something my wife and I had never quit talking about. We must find another place to live because L.A. is just so covered with smog, and it really was that yellow stuff that came up every day. And but so I bought a, mo- a gas station. I'm in the gas station business now. I bought a gas station in the High Sierras at Mammoth Lakes, California. Now, the reason for that activity up there was the Mammoth Lakes, Mammoth Mountain Lodge was just built. They were going to be open all year around now. And all the restaurateurs up there and the uh, stores and and, uh, uh, various people, uh, hotels and things up there, we're all excited that this was going to be the first year that Mammoth Mountain was going to be open all year. Okay. So there was a station up there, and they wanted that. It was a standard station. They wanted that open all year. And guess what? That's what I got. I got the standard station. Nice. Well, it seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah. What, one would think. Well, wouldn't one? Oh, think. that's right. I forgot the premise that this was actually the, the unsuccessful this, time. This I'm sorry. I don't mean to make light of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at the time, it was pretty light. We were pretty lighthearted. I was a skier, and uh, and we we loved the mountains. Good to say it. Lakes up there, fishing, it was wonderful. And uh, so we hauled our three boys, and and we went up to Mammoth Mammoth Mountain and opened this gas station with, uh, with a garage and everything. And we waited for business. It was September when we got up there. And some of the first business was triggered by snow. That is up in the high because the hunters would come up and they would break their cars and need tires and batteries and different things. And they all would need gas, which I had. But that didn't happen because there wasn't any high snow. Uh So this thing went on and then uh, we come to the uh, Thanksgiving when all the college kids are out and they're all up there by the thousands and thousands. And this is the year that Mammoth is open all year. So everybody was planning on coming up there. We didn't get any snow in at uh, Thanksgiving. And then Christmas, the big, the really, really big stuff. In 1959 to 60, Mammoth Mountain did not have any snow. Oh my gosh! Until about the middle of January. Okay, so we lost four, five, six months of business. And Just a me- critical time out of new business. Oh, it of really course. was. Yeah. It was a super critical time. I'm writing checks every month for all the things that we needed. Paying the rent on the property itself it was pretty steep. Jeez. And then when it snowed about the middle of January, we got 14 feet. We couldn't even move. <laughs> oh, you get was, it all at once. It was all crazy. Really, it was the most bizarre weather year that they'd ever had up there. I don't think they've had a bad one like that since. But That's crazy. I it, think actually I remember seeing pictures of that year because it's when they had the channels cut in, in the road and, and cars are – People are posing next to with their car next to a snowbank on yes. the side of the road. That's you know three more people high. Right, and we actually were able to walk uh, in certain areas and walk. And here was the the wires, uh, phone wires and stuff. And we stepped over them. I have pictures of me <laughs> stepping over. Uh, you know, they're thirty feet high. Oh and my goodness! Anyhow, it was a, a p- pretty bizarre situation, and nobody moved around then. They didn't move around before because there wasn't any reason. And then they didn't move around afterward because they couldn't. <laughs> There's nowhere to go. While. We had snow into uh, July. Oh, my gosh. In the w- lakes and things, which it was just an upside down year. Anyway, the day came when I had to look in my checkbook and go tell my wife, "Hunt, we're not going to be here next month because I haven't got enough money to stay any longer. And we had to give this thing up. I lost everything. Uh-huh. We had a pretty good, a pretty tidy sum when we moved up there. We were pretty confident that we were going to have a successful business like we had in L.A. when we had the mobile station. But it didn't work out that way. So we moved to the closest place we could move to, Sacramento, California. And we moved on to a five-acre dairy goat farm with the three boys. And we were in 4-H and 
try to continue our life on. I uh, found a job as a Firestone store manager, which is, I was quite up to that kind of thing. And we began to recoup our losses, which is not as easy as one might think. No, it's not. Really don't have any money at all. You just have to be very frugal with everything you do. And we were, it was an amazing situation. But we, uh, my wife and me, just as uh, the end results of all of this ended up being married 66 years. So, I mean, it was a, it was a very nice situation. I was very fortunate with three boys and wife that we all made the best of the th- situation, which you do just have to do. We, but this little five-acre dairy goat farm was really cool for us. We had chickens, dairy goats, obviously. And we were helped so much by 4-H. We were in the local 4-H group, and everybody helps everybody. And it was a little farm community, Elk Grove, which is oh, yeah. kind of saddles up to uh, uh, Sacramento. And I had the managership of the f- local Firestone store. So it was, it was an okay situation. But we had a lot of debt, and, you know, it was a tough one. It's not so easy. Um, During that time on the farm, my wife received a bunch of books, a bunch being four or five books, from her grandmother, who was concerned with how we were eating and how we were living. She and I didn't exactly get along. She was a <laughs> very outspoken uh, lady of, I don't know, 80 years old. And uh, I said and did some things that she didn't uh, necessarily approve of. I smoked at that time. I mean, this is back at a time when uh, just about everybody, everybody did, smoked. Yeah, I, I remember can, watching old TV shows, and it's yeah. like it, it's just right there. Hey, welcome here. Want a cigarette? I mean, yeah, it, sure. it was so pervasive. It was a it was not a good situation, but there you are. Yeah. Anyway, uh, she and I had a kind of a distant relationship. Believe me, I'd love to hold her and hug her and tell her <laughs> how important she was in our life right now if I could see her. However, she made it to 89, I think, so she didn't do too bad. Anyhow, she was, my wife and her were close. She sent us these books. One was written by Rodell, who was the founder of uh, Prevention Magazine and still has a huge enterprise in New York City. We've been there twice at least. And, uh, and that was an amazing book called Health. What? <laughs> Health Builder. Health Builder. Builder. Okay. 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 I should write this down. It's like an encyclopedia, and it uh, has all the things that we know we need now, like stay away from white flour. It doesn't have the bran and the germ in it, and some of the simplest things in the world are in there. And here we are. This book was published in 1950 or something. Uh, There was a, a lady who was very popular, uh, called Adele, Adele Davis, and she wrote books like Let's Cook Right, Let's Eat Right, Let's... Uh, anyway, it was a whole <laughs> series of books, and and they mentioned whole grains and better eating and staying away from what we would consider junk food, and they reiterated the losses in the foods we were eating and what we should... the wholesomeness of good food. So the things that we're concerned about today were kind of old hat I mean really they are because this is older stuff I keep those books in my office and I show them often to folks who ask me that very question and her grandmother's notes are in there this is very important be sure and read page such and such and do this and it was all about better eating and her concern with us raising three boys and them spending all their time eating junk food and pop and everything else things that that we pretty much determine if you get too much of it, it's not good for you, and it's a cause of obesity and and uh, so many of the problems we're having today, heart problems. Well, and that's one of the fascinating things about this story is that if you really think about it, if somebody didn't know the context, know how far back we're talking about, they would think that this is a conversation in some books you just read a couple of years ago. Right. Because these are all things that people are focused on now. And, I mean, not to sound like too hipster about it, but you were doing all this stuff before it was cool. 
Yeah, I probably was. <laughs> well, it, you know what? It's really my wife. Uh, now, Behind every good man, there's another smarter woman rolling her eyes. That's well, something I've heard. Yeah, I have to give credit where credit is due, Jared. I mean, she really was the instigator, and she's the one that drug me off to the one or two little health food stores that were around the grocery stores really had nothing in the way of yeah. wholesome food. There was, everything was just cut and dried and processed and everything else. It was a different kind of a world than we have today. And um, But uh, she was really the one that interested me and showed me the difference and then asked me to read this article or that article, which I did. And... Uh, I, I became a believer, especially when she began cooking that way, cereals. And uh, and the biggest thing I can remember, the one outstanding thing, was her multigrain bread that she baked. And every week she'd bake four or five loaves. And I'm telling you, that bread warm out of the oven was <laughs> unbelievable. If it was anything like the smell when I go into your yes, store, it's just yes. you walk in and it's like yeah. it's like the cartoon. The smell yeah. just kind of pulls you in. Exactly right, and it really pulled me in. That's great, great statement uh, of how I reacted to this stuff. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And then I quit smoking. That was the toughest. And then the flavor got even better. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. That was the <laughs> toughest thing I ever did in my life. Sure. And uh, but yeah, I that I know that because. I was 34 when I, st I was 17 when I started smoking and when I went in the army, and I quit smoking when I was 34. So I, s you know, smoked 17 years, and uh, it it was a godsend that I finally did get rid of this thing because I'd have long been dead like my dad. I just yeah. I would I had all kinds of bronchial problems and stuff, so. <sighs> I was sold on this. She was sold on this. And we did something that maybe some people wouldn't have done, and that is we shared these things with the boys. We didn't try to hide them. And we, we had a little philosophy that we believe these are really healthy things to eat, the whole grains. And, and uh, she made things that were uh, off the record, you know, as far as good really good, rich, whole grain stuff. And we talked to the boys about this. And we explained to them that we'd like to have only things that we really believed were healthy in the house, in the refrigerator, in the pantry. And I said to them, I can remember saying it, listen now, you guys, if I come around the corner down there and you're with some of your buddies and you got a Coke in your hand or something, don't try to hide it. I mean, it's not the end <laughs> yeah. of the world. Right. But we're going to try to do things a little different here. So what you see in the refrigerator, in the pantry, on the table, is healthy food. And it's pretty much established healthy food by people who kind of know what they're talking about. Right. We know even more now, lots more now. And that's what makes it so fascinating yeah. is as much as we know, it's the truth everything. stayed the yeah, same. It really has stayed the same. And that's been such an incredible thing in my life that I that, you know, just picked up these books, so to speak, and you start on a, a, a pathway and you find out that the pathway leads to the sunshine or something. I mean, uh, it's not bad. Well, I mean, and that's the thing is like... You, I, I'm impressed you don't like stand out on the top of Mount Hood and just see. I told you, you nah. know, like 30 years ago, because <laughs> I mean, everything that comes out just continues to validate the entire plan that you came really, up with for your family. It really does, uh, Jared, and and I'm so pleased because, you know, you just find yourself in that kind of a position. It's not, I, you know, it's great anyway. <laughs> So, so you got your boys on board. Yes. And that had to be and, the hard and, part. And, and it, <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I don't know. The boys are they're pretty sweet kids. Uh, and they're in the business now. So yeah. uh, not yeah. with me, actually. We tried to d do this together. And uh, the, the Reading had, where we were at the time had 15,000 people. Yeah. It was pretty tough to build a business that would support three families. It didn't anyway, so... I, I moved out to Portland and, well, found a mill up here 
the old Martin Brothers Mill on uh, Rothy Road in uh, in uh, Milwaukee, and it was just a kind of a no brainer <laughs> that I would start that. Well. The, and, and that's one of the, the amazing story or parts of this story is what started as just clean eating for your family turned into you're feeding everybody's family. And you've yeah. done that <laughs> through through the through you know, reading these things the what's old is new. Yeah. We missed something. We missed oh. something. Oh yes, well we let's need, go back. Yeah, let's go back. Okay. okay. <laughs> and on the farm. Oh. And after that. All of this whole grain food, this healthy stuff, which was hardly available anywhere, right. what did, it wouldn't have really done me much good or the, the world much good if I hadn't picked up a book in the library called John Goffey's Mill. The book was, believe it or not, written in 1950. Okay. The same year these other books were yeah. written in. So there was just a, a surge of, of wonderful information and revelation about whole grains because John Goffey's mill was a mill of the 1700s in Bedford, New Hampshire. At the time that I'm speaking of right this minute, it was closed because the family had kind of died away. And a fellow by the name of George Woodbury, who wrote this book, was the last remaining heir. And he received a letter that said, you have a flour mill in Bedford, New Hampshire. Wow. So that would be completely He went random. to see what it was. He was an archaeologist. He oh, traveled wow. all over the world, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, in Israel, everywhere, uh, doing uh, archaeological digs and writing uh, a matter about it and whatnot. So, I mean, put yourself in his place. He he's a delightful writer, and he went down there. Here it is, his family inheritance, six four hundred acres oh, wow. with a mill and a dam, and it was pretty derelict at the time because it hadn't been open for a long time. So this story, this this lovely book called John Goffey's Mill, is just the most delightful story of how he restored this mill and got it going, and he makes a statement after he got it going that the surprising part is that the public beat a pathway to his door for these whole grains, cornmeal and whole wheat flour and cereals and things that he created. It was an amazing thing, but that one statement that the, the public beat a pathway to his door, and I thought, this is crazy. If I could find some <laughs> millstones or a mill or whatever, I could do the same thing. And that would please me a lot. I knew it would please my wife. And so that became this underlying energy and thought process. And I wrote letters to companies that made flour mill equipment uh, who whatnot. And I really didn't get much response from anybody till I found one sent me a l my letter back with a note at the bottom that said we haven't handled anything like this for a hundred years stone mills but you might get in contact with this fellow who just recently restored the Metamora mill in Illinois and it was a an old flour mill and they wanted it in it was in their park service and this gentleman by the name of Dewey Sheets who was an old miller himself. He was a really old boy when I met him. <laughs> and had been taken on to restore this mill, which was restored to pristine operating uh, condition. And he knew where millstones were. And he found me millstones in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And why? Because... They were in this building that was an old mill, and they were going to tear the building down and put a shopping center in or something, <laughs> oh which is goodness. kind of a typical thing in America. Right, sure. You know, we don't don't save anything historic. <laughs> so uh, Dewey was able to get me this equipment, and basically that's the foundational moment of Bob's Red Mill when that, that happened. And the boys and I took this equipment and opened a business, which was okay, but it, it 
there was enough energy and impetus to keep it going to make us all like it, but there just wasn't enough it wasn't a big enough place and I don't think we had the vision that I somehow acquired in in recent years to well now wait a minute there's a story there too (laughs) all the time that I was doing all of this I was running a Penny's Auto Center now I, I told you that I did a Firestone store and I transferred from Firestone to uh um, to uh, um, J.C. Penny Company, and I, I ran the Penny's Auto Center in Redding, California. I moved. We moved up. The whole family moved up. <sighs> Jig jog here and there, up and down, back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> So the whole family was up there, and, and we were situated well, and I did well at the Penny's Auto Center for 10 years. I ran that. And during this time, all of this uh, business of trying to research whole grains and research stone milling, research this, research that, we found library books. We found an amazing array of books and uh, magazines even that were published monthly to the milling industry, which which had a lot of stories about old mills and history and things like that. And we just started accumulating, the boys and I and my wife, started accumulating to, to learn more about milling, what it really meant, what was happening in the milling industry. And everything was white rice, white flour, degerminated corn every we're taking everything out of everything right. and it's crazy and we could gee there's a big opening here somewhere for something and and we didn't take long to learn from people who had continued to do it the old way that when you grind grains in between two stones you can't remove the germ and the bran and toss it down the creek or feed it to the pigs <laughs> it stays in it whole grains mm-hmm. so this whole idea of stone grinding was a pretty big thing in our life we hadn't tried it yet we didn't really we didn't really know till we got till dewey's sheets equipment came and uh, we put it in a building just any old building but it was it was appropriate and we started grinding flour in this thing and advertising. And that's exactly what happened to us, what happened to, to George Woodbury. The public beat a path to our door. Wow. I was uh, totally impressed with it. But there wasn't enough public. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, they, they, they beat a path, but, you know, it's, it's one of those a things. a small just, path, a yeah. narrow path. Okay. Need so, a bigger path, more public. <laughs> okay. So, life goes on, and uh, I reach a point in time with the J.C. Penney Company when I could retire. And they gave me a, a nice income from from my 10 years with them and uh, there's something I had always wanted to do and that is to learn to read the Bible in the original languages the Old Testament being Hebrew the New Testament being Koine Greek well these kind of things kind of get caught in your craw even (laughs) though we have all this excitement about whole grain milling and all the wonderful things that we were doing and the reception by the public uh, was all good. But I saw this retirement with pennies, the limitations of Reading as an opportunity to fulfill something that was a dream and a desire of my lifetime. So where can I learn this? Portland, Oregon. They had five, five seminaries up here oh, wow. that taught those things. Now, do you still remember these languages? Could you no. S- <laughs> so, I, so I couldn't ask you to say, you know, you know when whole you grain. heard that expression, it's Greek to me. <laughs> that means you don't understand yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> okay, well, it's Greek to me. <laughs> they're they're not easy languages, and I'm not a person who takes to acquiring languages easily. Some people they learn twelve languages or something, and I'm not that person. I took four but years how of do you Spanish know and can still barely speak it. So yeah, yeah, I'm there yeah. with you. Uh, I mean, you know. it's 
tough enough to speak English without <laughs> stumbling all over the place. But but those were things that I had curiosities about, fundamental, basic belief, curiosities. And I was accepted by Western Evangelical Seminary, which was um, – uh, pointing, I'm, that's pointless. It was a, <laughs> just off of McLaughlin Boulevard and uh, on Jennings Avenue. And there oh, okay. it was. Wow. And it's still, the building is there, but it's become a part of George Fox okay. in uh, McMinnville now. So uh, they moved. But okay. they were very cordial to me, very helpful to me. And they took me in. I left the mill with the boys. I actually gave it to them. Uh, we took our, uh, what we had, we sold our home, which was an almost ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> that was back when houses were just being elevated. And it's just crazy what we paid for it, what it was worth. It was just, I couldn't, I, anyway, <laughs> or, Oregon was doing the same thing too. Yeah. It's just $12,000 houses that are. 150,000. I mean, at that time, you know, right. it's just crazy. But I, you you and your wife, so you and your wife are who came up to Portland yes. and your boys stayed she down was, there. She was willing to do this. Okay, awesome. I think she's she's good good lady. But the 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 and there's a recurring theme I keep hearing here just because it's funny. It's like, you know, again, with the food, what's old is new again. You know, the old knowledge is new knowledge. But you're talking about the housing market. Right. It's doing now what it was doing then. So I'm just seeing this pattern of I know, I know. You know. I know. Uh, it's just it's uh, everyone sees this kind of thing anyway uh we move up here and start seminary and it's uh, it's pretty tough <laughs> pretty tough i was retired and so i had time to take these classes a couple of times then i began tutoring because he had some students who were needed help and I don't know why I thought I was a teacher, but <laughs> at any rate, I thought, well, if we all go over these lessons in the evening, like 7 o'clock every evening, that we'll all learn better. So I would take the class, go home and study, come back at 6.30 or 7, meet with the students, and we'd go over the thing again. I just happened to be the instigator of <laughs> this extra work yeah. so that we could try to get this. We were working on uh, Koine Greek at the time, and phew, boy, that's a, that was a tough one. <laughs> Anyhow, we spent a lot of time studying. My wife was with me in all this, and we, we took cards and put the vocabulary on cards. We put the Greek on one side and the English on the other, and we'd take this pack of cards, and we'd walk around the neighborhood. After we'd been here a few months struggling with this thing, one day we walked down a certain street, Rothy Road, and there was an old mill. Hmm. Kind of providence there. Has never never been, uh, I don't know about it or anything. Hmm. And uh, it had been closed since 1957 when the railroad line that used to run down that we're trying to put back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's well, old right, is new yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, here we go. Uh, and they took it out, and the bill, that's how they got their grains and stuff was by rail, and they closed it. So there it sat, an old wooden building. And when I, it had a for sale sign on it. And when I made the phone call, just out of curiosity, my wife said to me, well, Bob, I thought we were going to learn to read the Bible in the original language. That, what, this, what, what are you going to? What do you want to do with this thing? <laughs> well, I said I'm just going to check. I'm just going to check. <laughs> uh, now I had already had five or six years of milling, so this really kind of hit me right between the eyes. And when I called, and the f owner of the property said. Uh, he had a lot of property, and he said, "Which which old Rothy Road? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he said, yeah, the old barn. <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, first thing we're going to do is tear that old building down because the property's worth more without it. 
<laughs> well, uh, I bought the whole thing. That's I incredible. And, you know, we kept school going for a while. But I tell you something else that happened. I needed a lot of cleanup crews to help me clean that thing up. It was a mess. And I used the stu- students. So, you know, things kind of go together. So Everything comes together. Kind of a cool, cool situation. So I, I used a lot of the students from that. And uh, we got the mill going. Within two weeks of getting the mill going, I had the media, I, I think Channel 2, came out and did a, a video on the milling. And you wouldn't believe what a difference that makes. I mean, if you think... Once again, the public beat a path to your yeah, door. I was going to say, if you think the media doesn't have a... <laughs> impact on things <laughs> you, you, you just need to try it hey sometime. we work in marketing and pr we know exactly what it does <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty amazing to me uh and uh so that admittedly was a pretty nice situation then after oh i don't know maybe a year mr myers fred meyer came into my place and saw the products we had and said those are the products I want in my store whole grains in a Fred Meyer store at that time he had 44 one stop shopping centers that's what he did yeah. and he wanted my stuff in his stores now we didn't go in the store he built 44 nutrition centers uh, next door t- or oh in the parking lot or over here or there, not w- in the store. Yeah. Okay. I think they were afraid maybe it would offend somebody or something. <laughs> I, I don't really know what the thinking was behind having a separate store. But he wanted a separate uh, whole, whole grain store uh, right next to the mill, and that's exactly what happened. We did um, um, all 44 stores, and, and it changed the whole store everything I was doing. The mill wasn't big enough. We rented the property across the street. We were running back and forth across the street packaging, (laughs) receiving grain, grinding flour, staying all night long sometimes. It was a delightful experience because we were making money. (laughs) And we were doing it, doing things that we really believed in. I couldn't hardly believe it. Then Safeway hit me up. They They had 100 stores in this area. And they wanted a, a three or four, I think it was a four-foot section of my products in every one of their stores. It's, it was astounding oh, what happened. This has got to be almost surreal for you. Because, it is almost surreal. I mean, I can't imagine the feeling of walking into a grocery store and seeing my face on anything but the security <laughs> camera readout where it's looking at you. I mean, what, what was that like for you the first time yeah. you walked into a store and see your own products there on the shelf. Oh, what was that feeling? I don't know, Jared. Really, that part of it, that that ego part, we all have enough ego to go around. You know? <laughs> and, uh, if, if my feeling was that if it would, I my whole thought behind all that was first I was advised to do that by a dear friend who I had a great deal of respect for. He was the president of the Fru and Oat Company, which is was a part of. Um, of, um, oh, another company, another big company. And I had a great deal of respect for him, and he told me I should put my picture and, and my name on the front so that uh, big corporations would stay away from me. They wouldn't want to buy me out all the time because they didn't understand the individualism and the stuff. They wouldn't even be interested in. And, and honestly, it would, it would have lost everything that was special to it. Well, and but to me, it was a sense of responsibility I mean, I right. ground that flower. Here's the guy that did it, and there's my signature. I, I coined a little phrase to to your good health, and I put that under my under my picture yep. and signed it, Bob Moore. So to me, it was more a matter of who's responsible for this, and I'm the guy that is, and I have still been. I still feel the same way. And that's still one of the feel the same way. That's one of the best parts about the experience is when people go to the store now, the, the headquarters store. Right. 
Now, you, you've since retired and stepped away from a lot of the operations, but you're still there. Wait a minute. I haven't retired. We're not retired. For, don't use that okay, word. Yeah, don't give me that. Yeah, yeah forgive me. I, I don't want to phrase it wrong. <laughs> yeah. But you, you've... Well, well, first off, and we got to go, go more to this. I go to work every day. Yeah. yeah. we got to go more to this because you've actually... All of your employees have ownership in this yes, business. Yes, they do. Which, again, is this phenomenal thing. We'll go more into that, but... As as you've as responsibility and roles have changed that you've taken on, you'll still be there, and they can go and see not just your bobblehead face, but you actually there <laughs> smiling, playing piano, and after I, all this time, there's still that love and passion for what you started. I right. can't help it. <laughs> it's how I feel, yeah. and and it's a wonderful feeling. I I wish everyone could have that sense of accomplishment and of taking their dreams to. Uh, completion and, and enjoying the fruits of their labor because that's what I have done and I, I, fr- I fully admit that is a reality so anyway how much has this grown from and I, I don't need a specific number because I, I can't imagine anybody's actually got that off the top of their head but it's grown from just a couple products to I mean you guys have this impressive array of products so Ballpark, I, I how, how many different things? I think that's exactly right, Jared. I think we're, from the very beginning, we created as many products as we could. It was a, uh, a challenge to us to try to, to go to the health food stores and places where they did have things. They had a, a very popular nine-grain cereal that was in the health food stores. Uh, I can remember bringing it home and on the kitchen table, putting a measured amount out and then taking a, a, a little stick and separating the grains. The yellow would be the corn and the, you know, the wheat and the, and the rye and this and that and the other. And the different grains, the barley and um, millet and stuff. And I separated it all out so I could get some idea of what the quantities were. Although, you know, all of them had ingredient labels on them. It told you what was in it. So it's not that complicated. And then I added uh, one grain that wasn't in it was triticale. That's a hybrid cross between wheat and rye. Huh. And it was very high protein. And at one time it was supposed to just take over the food chain because it was uh, it had a complete proteins and it wasn't missing any amino acids, so it had all eight of them and whatnot. So uh, we thought it was, re- but it doesn't have a very good flavor. But it didn't hurt the ten grain cereal. It enhanced it because now now you got a instead of a nine grain, you got a ten grain cereal. And that's just a nice and you know, it rounded added a number. great uh, dimen- uh, uh, protein uh, uh, dimension to it. So it, it was good. It was a good move, and you know, it's been a very popular cereal all these years. And then we had a four grain cereal that were rolled, and I added rolled triticale to that. <laughs> I kept getting more for my money, <laughs> and, and so, but but we actually had probably a hundred items almost. Really, th- really, really. Well, when month. you take cornmeal, let's just take corn. Okay. You grind it into cornmeal. You got coarse cornmeal. Uh, regular cornmeal, fine cornmeal. That's three things. Okay. Then you take that same corn and you uh, you make corn grits. You you take any of the flour out of it, <laughs> and so now you have corn grits. Then you got coarse corn grits and fine corn grits. Okay. So that's five things. Then you got the corn itself. That's six things. Okay. Now you take wheat and you grind it into whole wheat flour. Then you make uh, a uh, what we call a Help me. Uh, <laughs> the different grand parts flour. of wheat. <laughs> okay. Gram flour is coarse whole wheat flour. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't actually make a loaf of bread with it. you got to mix some other flours mm. in with it. But it's uh, it's got a crunchiness to it that people like. Okay, so that's two things. Then you, you take that same thing and you make a, a, uh, a uh, uh, wheat farina, which is fine, very fine. Then you make a, a cracked wheat, and uh, so you know you see. So, what I so mean? there's a lot of there's a lot of different variations you can do That's with right. like a few ingredients. Yeah, okay. there really is. And then when really it comes cool. to wheat, you've got hard red spring wheat, which is high in protein, makes bread. It's got high high gluten content. It makes a lovely loaf of bread. That's a, uh, and then you have white wheat, uh, soft white wheat, which you can use 
It does not have a tough, tenacious gluten. It has a soft, pliable gluten, and you can make pie crusts with it Ooh. and make uh, <laughs> pancakes and, and biscuits and things like that. So these are just totally different. They're, they're still got the same name, wheat, but they are different okay. in, in their reaction in, in, in the food in, when you're making food out of them. So it's pretty cool. Now, I, I readily admit this. Um, I know very little about the industry, just from what I've read from reading on your site and everything. But one of the products that we talked about before we started recording was your semolina flour. Right. I, I know this product personally and love it because I use it to make pasta. But I was excited about this opportunity to actually learn about semolina flour. Okay. How, how does that, where does that come from? And, and give me that S same semolina process. Semolina comes from, uh, from wheat, but it also is a hard red, hard white wheat. And and it uh, um, the name of it is skipping my name. You got it. <laughs> the brain trust. It, 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 it get you know. And for those who are wondering, he's looking back over at, at some staff that work with him, um, because like I said, a gajillion products, everything going on. Sure. I I don't have anything near the capacity of what he does, and I still rely on other people. Yeah. <laughs> but um, with with all these different things going on, and all all these different products, and in the, in the constant growth. I mean, how how did you keep up with all of that? I don't. <laughs> first thing that I had the to most learn. honest answer. First I've ever thing heard. I had to learn is that I couldn't do everything myself, and that I needed to hire people, and that's the most, the most precious thing of all. Uh, Durham wheat. Oh, okay, Durham wheat. Yes. Okay, Durham wheat. So that's three different wheats I've already mentioned to you. The Durham wheat. This is a hard white wheat. It makes that's what the pasta is made from. Okay. And it's. It just does a better job. It does the things you said that you it like about it. It makes amazing Then there's pasta. a hard, there's a soft white wheat, and that's the, what we call pastry wheat. And then there's the hard red spring wheat, which makes the best bread. So there's three right there. Now, you can believe me, farmers, uh, growers, and everybody's always messing around with them, trying to make something different out of them, and we try to respond to those too. So it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. It, it really is a living entity, a marvelous thing, actually, when you think about it. So there's got to be, there must be a lot of change in in these weeks and so been, forth since yeah. when you started, right? And then we have a movement like to go back to the old, to go right. to have the original, and those are. It's an amazing thing how accurate that stuff is. It's go, going back to like the Mediterranean area and 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 finding and f like in the Egyptian tombs and stuff. Uh, a, a wheat uh, called kamut, and it's, it was like 3,200 years old in an alabaster jar, and it still f sprouted for heaven's sake. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yes, yeah, it was amazing. Sometimes it's I really feel terrible about my that. gardening skills. No. Yeah, it, it's I don't know. I've never been, uh, never got bored with any part of any of this. It's so fascinating. Well, it seems like it. Grew, I mean. From Fred Meyer coming then to Safeway and you realizing that you needed help and you needed to hire people to do that, it seems like um, it grew really quickly. Oh, it did grow awfully fast. Yeah. I, I, I don't know in percentages. Uh, yeah, uh, it when we got all this going pretty well, pretty well. Ten years, and I loved it. And then we had a fire, oh. burned the mill down. Yeah, it was an old mill. It was dry wood, and, yeah. and uh, so it burned to the ground. And I was 60 years old, so what do you do when you're 60? You take your insurance and your retirement plan and your Social Security or whatever you can get, and you retire, but I, I didn't do that. I had lots of people by that time, 20, 30 people, yeah. who wanted to keep working. I'll, I have to go back a little bit because I, I need, before I ever thought of giving this to my employees, I had another thought. And frankly, it was based on the Bible, which says to me, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a very straightforward, simple, easy thing to understand. Nobody can really misunderstand it. And when... After about three years of success, I began to see profits looking pretty, pretty good. I felt that I should begin to 
divide those profits with my employees, the people that made it possible. That just I don't know how many other companies do such a thing, but I it it, it bore down on me, and I felt a strong sense of responsibility to do that. And how it came about is we had a particularly good month, and I looked back three months because I thought, well, if I'm going to give part of this profit to my people and I need it back because I need money to do things with, buy grain and stuff, um, I can't get it back once I give it to them. So I thought what I better do is go back three months, and I did. I went back three months, and I looked at that profit, and I took that as the major point, and then I averaged it with these two, the second month and then the current month, so that I always had a little resource if I needed it because yeah. I didn't create any liability or responsibility to do this. I just gave it to them out of the blue, and I can remember one in particular of my people who's still with me today. When I gave him his paycheck and I said, Dave, here is a second check, which is your share of the profits for three months ago. (laughs) (laughs) Why, they didn't really expect that. Right, of course not. (laughs) Uh, Now, I didn't do this every month because when I averaged it out, it didn't come out very well because I didn't always make a nice profit. Sometimes it was pretty good. Sometimes it wasn't so good. But I had a, 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 a line that I drew through it, and if it came above that, I split it with them. And if it went below that, I didn't. I had, oh, success three, four months, maybe first couple of years. Then it got better with eight months. We paid every month. And I think 27 years ago, we started paying a generous portion of the profits to our employees every month of the year, 12 times a year. That is something pretty special. Well, it was special. So I mentioned this before that you were doing, the, you know, the the whole grain thing before it was a fad, before everybody else in you know yes. in the industry really I took think that we on. Had a little head start on it. <laughs> but same thing when it comes to the profit sharing with your employees. Yes. This is something you're starting to hear more companies taking on, as you know the responsibilities of, of businesses evolves and, and what people view their role is. So again, you, I mean, you're on the forefront, and this is what has made you guys a very very popular place to work you've got some of the happiest employees on the planet i don't have much turnover yeah (laughs) i can't imagine why you would with that kind of setup i have lots of people who've been with me you know 20 years 25 years and that kind of thing and we've retired people who spent you know most of their working life and then they're they retired so it's 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 been, been very nice that would almost seem to me to be even possibly more rewarding than the success of the business and seeing your products uh, out there everywhere, but that family sense and and knowing that you've made so many different people happy and created a place that they love to work. That would be an amazing feeling. Well, I work hard at it. <laughs> I do. It means a lot to me. It's very, very important to me. And it's very clear. You can see that. It very does mean important that. to me. So walk me through quickly when – when you were like in the heart of, of, of this, when, when things were just really booming and you, before you you know expanded as large, what was your day like? Because I, I can't imagine you even fitting everything you did into a 24 hours a day, let alone having some time to sleep. So you know, how, what was your day like? What time did you wake up and get this thing going? Well, I've always been a kind of an early riser and a late, late going to bed. But uh, it, it's, there's no question about it. I had to work the long hours and and I shared them with others who were uh, responsible people that came to work for me and, and eventually became partners, actually. So I've, I've not been reluctant to share the benefits of successful business with others, as well as the responsibility and as well as the time. However, I must say that for the first 10 years of the business, I spent a lot of time down there grinding flour, sacking flour. Uh, and we would trade off like one of us would work till 8 o'clock and then somebody would come in at 8 and work till midnight and then somebody else and then I might come in at 4 in the morning or something 
and we just did that. But you know, that's because we had these big bursts of of uh, of need, and and uh, so like I I can remember when Safeway came on board. My guy said <laughs> that must have been huge. Yeah, it was a pretty big thing, and we we really needed to start working around the clock. There's no question about it. We work around the clock now. We work uh, uh, seven days a week. We never shut down. Wow. We have not closed the mill, well, except for a couple of three holidays a year, Christmas and Thanksgiving and a couple of things, maybe others. But um, it just takes, uh, in order to get the, the uh, kind of uh, production you need, you just have to keep things going. And you g- you start getting good production after you've been running for a little while, and then if you shut it down, it takes the same. P- we just we've learned a lot about this kind of thing. We have meetings about it, and I love all that stuff. I love listening to to my professional people who can tell me how they achieve ninety nine point seven uh, percentage of uh, shipping to our customers, which is nearly a hundred percent. And that's pretty tough to do. I mean, you really have to have everything right. Yeah. Yeah. Everything right. And we're we're achieving that now. We that, it was that's what it was last month. Oh wow. That's, that's impressive. <laughs> right, oh, wow. right. Now you mentioned that mill is, is running, you know, virtually twenty four seven. But the really cool thing about that is and again, something unique to the industry in, you know, a lot of the food industry out there is people can actually come and see this happen. Well, I think it's very important because I do have I think some competitors who really are just people who uh, call around and get others to make various things for them and put their name on it. And uh, I don't do that, so I don't have any products that are not made, you know, by, in, in we do the mixing, the grinding, uh, the uh, combination of things, uh, and the packaging is very important. And I, I put everything on display. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, we give tours. It's uh, Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock. We open the doors, and, and we, we average about 50 folks a day. It's just a pretty good crowd sometimes, 100 even. And some we have to I – actually, I think we've gotten kind of gotten so we've had um, a minimum uh, or, or maximum that we can do, and we just ask them to hang around for a little while, and we'll make two tours instead of one. But we, we, we like entertaining our our customers and potential customers. It's very nice. We have a nice video that's on a big screen, and they really get a good taste of because I can't show them everything. But <laughs> and, and then uh, we have walls plastered with pictures, and then we have all of our old equipment. I have about four or five mills that we've taken out of uh, service because they were really the old original mills, and uh, uh, oh yeah, and uh, uh, that's very important. And then also too, we have a lab. I used to depend on others. There's several labs here in town that can test for protein and test for gluten, okay. various things like that. And in the beginning, I would have to take little bags of stuff up there with dates on them, and and then I'd have to hold that till they tested it so that I knew it was okay to, to uh, okay. Uh, process it. And uh, so there's always a delay. So I was able to hire a serial chemist who was a graduate of Kansas State University. That's about the only real milling uh, university in the, in the country. Hmm. And um, he was instrumental in getting together the equipment we needed to have our own lab and now we have an extensive lab it's lovely uh, it's uh, manned by uh, folks uh, 24 hours a day and uh, we have a microbiologist on staff who is an absolute wonder she has taken the company's uh, certification to the very top and we're just right at the top right now of of uh, all the various things that uh, the testing and whatnot of foods and everything, so we're we're very pleased with the professionalism that we've been able to bring to the old fashioned foods. <laughs> <laughs> well, know? and it's it's so important to people now, especially the people that are buying your products, right. to be able to. 
people really care about where their food is coming from more and more. And so to have these tours to see um, is high, it's highly valuable to them. And no wonder you're getting over 100 people <laughs> showing up <laughs> wanting to see. Well, uh, we, we've had some of our suppliers have been with us since the beginning, farm co-ops in Montana, for instance, for our hard red spring wheat. We're still, I mean, it has been 40 years, <laughs> maybe longer. So it's pretty amazing. And then, of course, in some cases, uh, you have to go where this exclusive product is grown, like uh, uh, coconut is usually grown, most of it, all of it, in, uh, in the Philippines. And that's, uh, we, we go over there a lot. Our buyers uh, over there and check with things. Uh, our microbiologist has been over there a few times. We go down to uh, 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 Peru and uh, in South America for our quinoa. There's a number of different things that will grow the best in some of the craziest places. <laughs> you can't believe it. Uh, Saskatchewan in Canada around Regina it gets so cold up there, it's terrible. You know, I mean, it's like 60 below zero. I don't know how people live up there. <laughs> and yet that makes the best oats, and you can't believe how, how much better the, the flavor. I won the, well, the company has won twice now the uh, Golden Spurtle in, in Scotland. You know, the Scots think they're the best oat makers, the porridge makers mm -hmm. in the world. They have a contest over there. It's been going on now for maybe 30 years. And people come from all over the world and enter their oats, their best product. And we've been over there uh, consistently, but uh, we don't win every year, but we have won three times, actually. <laughs> and uh, But they just simply flat said, you know, y you have the world's best oats, porridge. And that oat, believe it or not, comes from Saskatchewan. And we've had this uh, these wonderful farmers. They're all... It's a farm co-op, and, and they're dedicated to gluten-free. They don't grow any wheat, rye, barley, or triticale or anything like that that has the gluten in it. That's, so we have a gluten-free, uh, very consistent, delightful uh, oat uh, product that has just taken, we think, just the best flavor, the best consistency and everything, and... The Scots had to admit that we had the best oats, too. So, so <laughs> is, is there like a picture of you on a dartboard somewhere over in Scotland now where they're... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that might be. I don't know. But I love going over there. The people are just so so uh, cordial and lovely to deal with. They're just... Uh, it, it's an experience in and of itself. It really is. There are so many amazing things that can be made with your products, and... You know, one of the one of my favorite aspects of that is people can actually get those ideas and try them themselves before they have to actually like make it themselves at home at the store, at the country store. Right, we can. We do try to give tours, and and then we also try to to uh, get them started with um, uh, uh, <laughs> with uh, how to cook and stuff. I tell you what, I think really better than anything although I'm very proud of our store because every single size and product that we have is in the store. So, I mean, uh, it's kind of a show-off type of thing. You oh, know? it's an amazing experience. It yeah. really is. Thank you for saying that. Um, and then we have a bakery where we bake stuff and we have a kitchen where we make stuff <laughs> and uh, we have classes where we give classes. Uh, but I think that for most folks... Our website, uh, bobsredmill.com, follow the prompts for whatever you want, recipes. And that was that was the next place I was yeah, going to go is because yeah. there's this wealth. And then your social media, I mean, I, I mean, social media for a living, so right, I mean, what right. you guys do is impressive, is showing off what other people have made right. and coming up with so many ideas. And, yeah, I've stolen a few from there. It, it, yes. There's some great stuff. But, you again, you've taken – the, the old ways and uh, merge them with with new technologies and, and <laughs> continuing to lead the way <laughs> that's pretty wonderful really <laughs> and but i couldn't wait we have a it's an entire department now our social media and our website and stuff so i mean it 
it should be very fulfilling for anyone who wants to take a little time to look at it because there's a lot of stuff there. Anything that seems uh, important or new or good, we try to put it on there. So it's 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 a lovely uh, venue for finding out things about uh, whole grains as well as our company. So I'm I'm very happy to have it. So for our listeners, uh, what is that website? The website, again, is uh, www. I guess they don't usually use that much. <laughs> www.bobsredmill.com. Uh, and, and then the, the prompts, it'll pop right up. Right. And the recipes or uh, what, if you want to give us an order, we'll take that too. <laughs> <laughs> Come but, up with some uh, ideas and then yes, order it to make uh, it happen. There you go. Or, and it's the same name for your handle on social media and Instagram, yeah. Bob's Red Mill. Yeah. Pretty and simple. What I love yeah. about it, um, even though I don't have a gluten intolerance or right. any special restrictions, is for those that do, there are recipes and right. products that can, can people can still eat the same foods with whatever dietary restrictions they have. We really feel that way. I th- think one of our greatest successes was a, a product we call One to One, and meaning that you can substitute white flour for this product, and it's a it's got three stone ground flours in it that are gluten free, okay. and then it has uh, uh, xanthan gum, which is the body that replaces the gluten and makes it rise, so you can use it. And it's been the most successful, I think, the most successful thing that we really developed in house. And it is just, it really is a major product that we sell a lot of. So it, it, it it's mainly for the gluten-free, uh, gluten-intolerant uh, people that, that uh, absolutely. anyway. <laughs> yep. That, I mean, and that's something that's come along and maybe, you know, being in the industry, you, you saw this trend coming, you know, before others, but it, I remember I first heard about uh, gluten-free, gosh, maybe about like five, six years ago now, and it, it was probably before that. But is this something that, that, you knew there was going to be issues with coming along in the future or is this you know something that just kind of came along and you guys had to have, have had to adapt well i think it's interesting i had uh i was in business for a while five years maybe or so and then a group came down to me from seattle called gig gluten intolerance group <laughs> and um they were rather insistent that i consider Doing separate uh, products with the, the f- keeping things separate from gluten free. Well, how do you know? Well, there's a test. <laughs> you remember the name of that? Eliza test. I think it was formed originally in Germany. Okay. Of being able to take a product that's supposed to be doesn't have any gluten in it and test it because when you grow wheat and then you grow corn which is gluten free and you use the same truck or the same tanks or the same storage or whatever uh, it's the corn isn't gluten free it wasn't checked gluten free because it's got mixture of flour in it and everything else so this was a whole new world for the agricultural industry Believe me, it's come a long way. And I'm not sure just how active GIG is. is. I know they still exist. But they set forth a program that uh, eventually, if you want to be successful, you better listen. (laughs) Uh, In the original wooden mill, I didn't have a lot of separate space. But I started to keep things like rice and corn and millet. These are all gluten-free grains, and I was handling them over in like across the street until I actually needed them. Then I'd clean the mills out real well, you know, more or less. The, the final analysis was to take a sample of it down to the lab, which I did not have a lab. Take it down to the lab, and it had to check less than 200 parts per million. So that essentially meant that it was gluten-free. 
Okay, that was the national specs and the specs in Canada, 200 parts per million. And then they got busy and changed those specs to 20 parts per million. It's a bit of a cut. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was a real challenge. But by that time, we had our own lab, and that was brought about by my uh, hiring a serial chemist who knew all this stuff just intrinsically. That was part of his his life. His part. And um, so we double-checked it now and then with the folks downtown, but basically we were doing all of our own testing, and we were doing better and better. Then we began working with the farmers who grew our stuff, our corn farmers. It was very important that they didn't grow wheat, ever. And, and we, we had a, a set of criteria that we expected from these people. And yes, we pay a premium for all this. It's not free. You've got all this special uh, needs and special uh, treatment and whatnot, and you're gonna pay extra, and I cannot help that. Yeah. You simply can't ask somebody to work for nothing. So we have, co we have, <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, I just, no worries. <coughs> suddenly exploded. No, I've been having yeah. problems myself. <laughs> Tis the sneezins. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> sorry. Um, this whole gluten thing is now represent almost 50% of our business. Oh my we goodness. We take it very serious. We have a fully separate a facility for gluten-free and everything in that facility is geared to changing the air and and vacuuming to keep any any foreign things and then the other part of our operation where it is gluten is treated this same way it has all of its own separate uh, fans and suction machines and supply things and everything else and then we're continually testing all the time. Every, we divided everything into 2,000-pound units. That happens to be a tote bag, what we call a tote bag. And every single tote bag is tested for gluten that's supposed to be gluten-free. Oh, wow. And it always checks under 20 parts per million. Wow. Then another change came about. We wanted to get into... Uh, other countries. We're in 80 countries around the world now. We have wonderful distribution in Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Australia, England, uh, of course Canada as being a foreign country actually. <laughs> and, uh, and and just keeps going. It spre keeps spreading all over. But um, Australia passed a law that said gluten-free is gluten-free. You can't test anything. Oh wow. That's Zero. strict. But we have a lot of our stuff test zero. A lot of our stuff. We have uh, truckloads of, of uh, units of 2,000 pounds that test. No, the, the, the test is just zero. No, no detected. So we don't have any trouble shipping our products when we set it aside when, it's, when it is zero, which it is most of the time. And that product we can sell to countries who have these very stringent rules that says no gluten. And we can meet that. So Once we've again, ahead really of the curve. taken this whole thing from 200 <laughs> parts to 20 parts to zero. But it's taken a lot of years. We've been probably doing this for 30, 30 plus years. And it's taken people with vision and stuff like the gig, gig folks uh, and, and others who have been instrumental in keeping our our nose to the grindstone <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and making sure that uh, uh, that we do it right so it's it's a it's nearly a science now well before we wrap up I was curious if there's any anything new coming down the pike that you can share with us any sort of you know new product or you know change in things that might be fun for our listeners to hear about here first Jared. And I'm I don't totally know. putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about new things. I, I presume you mean new grains and stuff. We're bringing things like teff and amaranth and various grains that, uh, and, and right now, um, there are some other things uh, in, in the offing. And. Um, 
cassava flour is a fully uh, it's it's ground it's the uh, root of um, what huh cassava bean I think there's another because <laughs> I know but I think there's another name for it anyway it's uh, uh, it's gluten free for one thing okay so it's oh, another okay. gluten free product yeah but it does some wondrous things we've got some great recipes on our website yes, yes. And, uh, and it's just taking the world by storm, or we think it is anyway. <laughs> well, we, cause we'd like to think it is. Cassava uh, flour. So yeah. hopefully you heard it here first. I know I did. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> I, I think we brought a bag of it with us oh, that cool. I could read something off of it that might make it <laughs> clearer as to what's hard for me to remember oh, everything I have. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, and I see. I see it as the bag goes by. Yeah. I see on the back there's a recipe well, for cassava brownies. Is, cassava flour is made from the whole root of the cassava plant. It has a mild flavor and a fine texture that is perfect for gluten-free and grain-free cooking. Use cassava flour for baking flat bread and brownies as breading for meat and seafood, or in place of breadcrumbs in meatballs and veggie burgers. And I must say that our website now embodies some recipes that are not not mentioned here. So well, I think I've got like ideas for the next like five dinners and desserts I'll be making for this week. So I'm actually so happy you brought product because that was something I would have forgotten to mention. As somebody myself, I am new to the to the cooking game. Right, right. Um, trying to adult over here, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, there was I started reading recipes, and I went to the local Fred Meyer, and I saw on your products they all say what they're best used for, how you can use them, and it helped me so much. Oh. It helped me so much in determining the product to buy for the recipe I had because it said right I could read right on your right on your container this is best for this type of of meal and I just even though it, you have that on your website which is great if you're planning in advance if you run to the store and you forget you have it right there and that's so important and that's what everyone will be able to see. Well, thank you Molly for <laughs> that. Uh we have <clears throat> we have a very dedicated uh uh, group of people, uh, Scully, I don't know, we're, we're um, must be eight or nine folks who are very adept at creating things, and uh, and they will take new products and develop names and nice things to say, and then we have a kitchen with uh, sometimes three different uh, chefs in it. These are very well-trained people. And uh, I think Sarah's been with us for about five, six years now. I said something about five years, and she jumped on me and said it was seven, I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, she's uh, well-trained and well-educated and loves whole grains and developing new things. We, we've, we're very active in, in finding ways to use, new ways to use uh, uh, whole grains. And I, I mean... It's, it's pretty exciting to me because, well, I love it, and it's very healthy. It's exciting to us, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's time in the program where we move on to our little game that we like to play with all of our guests, and we call that game Would You Rather. <laughs> Every week, Molly curates five Would You Rather questions, and the idea is just to get to know a little bit more behind the person that we're interviewing. So we ask these five questions, and it's just, you know, first thing off the top of your head, what your answer is, and we'll just riff off that a little bit. But it's just a fun way to get to know our people just a little bit better. Okay, Molly. Okay. Fire so, away. Since we were just talking about product, I'm going to go down to that question first. It's super simple. So would you rather cookies or cake? Oh, come on now. <laughs> I, good grief. I try to eat a very limited amount of all that. And you must remember, I'm in this business, and they're always making things. Yes. They're always bringing cake down or <laughs> cookies down. Yeah. So what's your point. favorite one that they bring down? Well, I, I like cookies, and I like them whole grain, and I like them with lots of oats in them and not too sweet. Okay. Because the wholesome of it uh, impresses me, yes. and, and I feel like they're probably better for me than some other things that one might eat. Cake, on the other hand, usually is is meant to be very sweet. And I 
I have, because of my diet, I have a kind of an aversion to very sweet things. I, I, I don't have a huge sweet tooth. So uh, you don't impress me when you have things that are just, just almost saccharine sweet, you know. Okay. So I would have to say that I think definitely that the cookie, the, at least the, <laughs> so, the, the selection of cookies, the whole wheat, made with whole wheat and whatnot. There's a lot of different cookies we have. We I think we make 20 or so different things at the store, and they're all really pretty good. Well, I wish that I did not have a sweet tooth. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. So you're lucky there. <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> all right. Uh, would you rather hold a snake? Yeah. Hold a what? A snake. Snake? Yeah. And? Or... Kiss a jellyfish. What? <laughs> what kind of question are those? They're tricky. Well, I don't. A jellyfish. Yeah. I wouldn't want to do that. I know that. So I suppose the snake depends on the snake, of course. Boa constrictors or or rattlesnakes might. I might run the other way. <laughs> and I feel like my answer would be neither. I just, I just, I can't. I, I, I don't do think it. he knew that was a choice, though. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay. that's a tough choice. <laughs> okay, would you rather, um, in a movie, if you were playing something in a movie, an would actor? You, yes. Oh, dear. Would you rather play a villain or the hero in a movie? Well, I think I'd rather play the hero. Yeah. But the villains have so much fun. No. no. Well, heroes. <laughs> that's that's it. Like in everything, I always root for the good guy. I'm not one of those like yeah, people. Man. But still, doing bad is always more fun than doing good. <laughs> isn't it? I don't. I'm I'm not a scientist of that nature. So. All right. Would you rather be a stand-up comedian or a concert pianist? Oh, we know that one. Uh, I th I think I could say I'd rather be a concert pianist any day. <laughs> I, I I love the piano. I I don't play very well. I've never had a lesson, but I play all the time. I, I may have heard that. And <laughs> one of my pride and joys is my lifetime was to acquire a, a nine foot Steinway concert grand in my home, and and it's just the most beautiful instrument in the world. And even I can make it sound pretty good. <laughs> so, yes, I think pianos I are so it. romantic. Yeah. All right, last question. The easiest of them all. Okay. Dog or cat would you rather have? Uh, what? What's a dog. It? A dog or cat? Uh-huh. Well, I've had about half and half, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if you could only have one. Well, I'm afraid I'd have to have a beagle. Yeah. Oh, I love beagles. Oh, yeah, a beagle. Yeah. Good. But I've had several... And uh, there's there's such love. There's an ad on TV right now with a beagle baby, little baby beagle, and it's the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I, I know the commercial you're talking I've, about. I've yeah. seen it maybe three times, and I just I just glued to it while it's, <laughs> while it's on. It's it. I can remember getting Annie, my wonderful. She lived 16 years. Oh wow! And uh, when we first got her, we picked her out at six weeks. But we couldn't get her till she was eight weeks old, and then uh, we got her at eight weeks, and uh, it, it started the, a love affair that uh, is just uh, still in my heart even today. Although she's been gone for a while. See, yeah. this is why we ask these questions because it gives us different insights oh, yeah. into the people that we interview. She was the sweetest thing in the world, just the sweetest thing in the world. Well, I love that. I'm obsessed a little yeah. with dogs. She, she so. is totally obsessed with her dogs. It's, it's, <laughs> it's what kind of dog do you have? I have labs, and they're oh, they're, they're brothers lovely too. Yes, yeah. of course. I like non-aggressive uh, yeah. dogs. I'm just that way. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and beagles are about the most non-aggressive yeah. creatures on earth. They just so sweet. <laughs> they don't, don't depend on it to defend anything. No, no, no. <laughs> no I, pro I probably couldn't, shouldn't like say anything bad about you being obsessed with your dogs, though, because how many times am I showing you pictures of my puppy? Right, yeah, I think you love them, too. What kind of a puppy we, do you we, have? We, we have a lab, uh, oh, but, okay. but we also have, um, I got a Malamute puppy. Okay. Um, there actually, two months ago. Uh, replacing a, a Malamute Husky mix that we lost last year, They're and, and I am obsessed with my Malamute. He is just this big, <laughs> lovely fluff ball. I remember several years ago we always used to watch the uh, the dog shows and things, and um, uh, that the um, 
that Malamute, I think, won the the ultimate uh, prize for the year of all the dogs. And uh, it was uh, really pretty beautiful dog. Absolutely beautiful. I remember looking. I couldn't believe how pretty they were. They are gorgeous animals. Yeah, they really That's a, are. A table lovely. of dog lovers. We got a good table here. Yeah. It's almost a shame that we have to end the show. I know. But, uh, Bob, I really appreciate you coming in because it, it gave us some fascinating insight to a business that I already think is incredibly interesting. And to hear the story in person is always such a treat. So I really thank you for uh, taking the time. Well, thank you so much for asking me both, Sally and Jerry. Thank you again and again. <laughs> and to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to Territory Tales. We'll have you next time. <laughs>